You're listening to the Cantina Cast. Your home for thought-provoking Star Wars talk. Join Adler and Jonesy in breaking down the latest news, trailers, movies, and of course, your favorite characters from a galaxy far, far away. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cantina Cast. My name is Albert Padilla, and this is episode 495, our breakdown of Tipping Point. The latest episode of The Bad Batch, which as of this recording won't be for maybe maybe another four or five hours. But nonetheless, we can't we're we're back. Uh, This is an episode that is critical to the overall story. And a lot was really kind of I think they've kind of shown their cards for the most point. I think we kind of understand that we're at least going back to Tantus for a lot of different reasons. But beyond that, I don't know where this episode or the series is going to end. So. Uh, I do know that with us tonight is Jonesy. Jonesy is our special guest. Jonesy, welcome for being uh, being here. Knows how to spell Tantus. Did I spell this wrong again? Uh, let me up, let me update that. There. <laughs> how you doing tonight, Jonesy? That's two weeks in a row. I've, I've two weeks in a row. I've been able to give you a hard time. So this feels really good. You've there made you my go. week. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, no problem. I'm doing well, man. It's been a it's been a good week. It's been a busy week, but we are man. We're 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 here. We're at the last two episodes of Bad Batch. I'm glad we get to squeeze this in. Sorry for everyone for a bit of a delay there, but. Glad to get this episode in right. This episode finally, this was kind of that transitional episode that we we were been waiting for for the last few weeks, and we finally got it. So it felt really good to finally get it. And this it was really well done. I like this episode a lot. There's a really there's a bunch of little clues here and there too, which will be fun yeah, to kind of talk yeah. through tonight. But um, but yeah, but how are you doing, sir? I'm good. I was uh, the delay was my fault. I went camping this weekend, and I was I had no voice on Monday. I mean, it was completely gone. I'm still a little again. I, I know I keep saying this seems like every week. It's just that, that it's that time of year. Allergies are just going yeah. crazy. But yeah, being out in the woods all weekend long, uh, mon- Sunday night was just not going to happen. So we had to defer it, and Jonesy was kind enough to give me another day so I could recover. But I'm still a little raspy, but you know, it's it's got a little smoky lounge singer tone to it. So That's I'll right. go with it. But yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, no sweat. Hey, a little bit of news before we get started. Out today, our friend Adam Christopher, Shadow of the Sith in paperback is available today. So if you have not picked up Shadow of the Sith, and you've been waiting for it to come out on paperback. Shame on now's you. The, well, well, now's the time. Yeah. There's no time no like the present. Yeah. Again, beautiful cover. This thing looks great in paperback as well as it does in, in hardback. So definitely recommend. This is kind of required reading if you're looking for that in-between state for Luke of, uh, Luke of Skywalker. Luke Skywalker. <laughs> and a little bit of Lando, you know, and, and that kind of a story. So really good story. Good, solid Star Wars stuff. Adam Christopher's a, just a great guy. So it's just really cool to, to support great authors doing good work. So uh, go check that out at your favorite bookseller. Yeah. And if you haven't, if you haven't had a chance, once you're done, or if you'd like just a refresher, you can go back to episode 428, which is what we did last year, where we did the interview with Adam Christopher and, and talked a lot about this book and had a fun time talking about, uh, we did a speed round of questions with him. So good stuff there. If you really want to uh, have a good laugh with him as well. And speaking of good stuff, Jedi Novel Archive, man, Lauren, again, has been just churning it out. Huge, huge props to Lauren. She's been just on top of it. It's, it's a, man, we've just had ample books and, and stories and comics and everything coming out. So uh, the, the High Republic Cataclysm sneak peek is out now. So the embargo was lifted for that. The book hasn't come out yet. I believe it comes out next week or the week after early April. So you're going to want to check that book out. But the sneak peek is available over on the YouTube channel. And then just a few minutes ago, she posted the the High Republic, the Blade comic book series. So a review of that issue four comes out this week. She's got your spoilery review of all of that, walks you through the story, lets you know if you want to go out and pick the story up. Uh, a little bit of a hint, she really liked it. So I think this is, a, this is something you want to go check out. It's all over on the Cantina Cast YouTube channel, cantinacast.com slash YouTube. And you can find all of her other great content out there, of course, with uh, Jedi uh, Battle... Jedi Battle Scars. There we go. Uh, the new video game, the prequel to the uh, video game coming out from Jedi Fallen Order, of course, is out there too. So lots of great content out there for you guys to go check out. And then a special congratulations to a friend of the show, of Mr. Ryan C. Showers, on his 100th episode of Scream with Ryan C. Showers. And I know this is something near and dear to your heart as well. Yeah, well, this was a, this was a show that was part of Eargly Media before we kind of dissipated that. Or I don't know, we took it down like the Senate pretty much. But 
Uh, yeah, so he just had 100 episodes, and I was uh, privileged enough to be the producer and editor for the first 92 episodes. And so this one is kind of a, the first, it's basically two parts. The first part is kind of a breakdown of, of Scream 6, and they kind of turn the movie into what they kind of uh, they theorize about what would it be like if it was put into a television show, which is kind of a cool concept. And then the second half is Ryan and I, and I had the idea of coming on to the show and really kind of pulling back the curtain and talking about a lot. We, we get into like a lot of the creative process and just starting up a podcast. What does that mean? Logos, the intro music. We uh, channeled Jonesy's voice a few times in there because he was a, he contributed to a lot of the success as well. So, but yeah, it was just really kind of reminiscing about the last, you know, basically two years and how that show went from, boy, I wonder if anybody's going to listen to you know, thousands of people listening to it every week now and looking forward to it feverishly every week. So if you're a fan of Scream or any of the Scream adjacent material, that is definitely a podcast you want to check out. They are so fanatical. I learned so much, honestly. Like I was a casual fan of Scream at best, right? I'd seen the movies and when they come out, I go see them. And I, although I'm not like, I can't win trivia night, but I've got a deeper understanding and appreciation of that series. It's on par with what we do with Star Wars just for Scream. And you would think like, at least for me, as ignorant as this may sound, I was thinking, well, you know, how many people really like this? There are so many people that are just enamored and obsessed with this franchise. And so, yeah, that's, that's your, that, those are your homeries if you're interested in, in learning more about Scream. So go check it out. Uh, it's released today, and uh, the feedback has been overwhelmingly humbling and positive so far. So congratulations on 100 episodes, Ryan. Yeah, absolutely. It's really cool. I love the interview half of it as well. I had a chance to sit down and listen to it, and it's just a lot of fun to, again, just to hear about it. And you can just hear the passion from Ryan you know, as he talks through it and, and what the idea was, how it all came together. It all came together so fast, and I remember that, just getting the website set up and things like that for him. And so it was really it was really cool to see it come together so quickly, but also to hear all of the other things going on behind the scenes that I had had an idea about from our conversations together about what was going on, but all the iterations of the music and what you were trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish with the, with the uh, visuals of the, uh, the, oh gosh, not the title card, but the, the logo. Yeah. Yeah. The logo. Yeah. It was just really cool to finally hear all of that. And again, just hear what the idea and the genesis of it all was. And again, you talk about finding a place kind of out of nowhere, uh, something that was just underserved for what they were trying to accomplish. And the way that he wanted to do it was just the perfect time, the perfect place. It's just one yeah. of those stories. So it's just really exciting to hear all of that from him. And so huge congratulations, really nice guy. He's he's always been a huge supporter of Eagle Media when we were, we were doing that bit. And so huge thanks to him. And uh, congratulations to you too for 92 plus one episodes of producing and editing that show. It only you know, took a few uh, hours every night. That's all. Well, I mean, and, yeah, I like your perspective on it, though. It was a challenging show, but it was also a lot of learnings from it, too, of, of editing and, and how to get better at doing things and yeah, overcoming yeah. some of those challenges. So it's always it's another it's another example of taking something that's challenging and turning it around into a positive and that you do get something of great value out of it and you produce something that people love. And that feels really good when you get that kind sure. of feedback. And you've had that feedback directly from 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 some folks that listen to the show too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been so very supportive. And yeah, so that's, so that's amazing when when you know the, the folks kind of behind the scenes get that get that recognition as well. Yeah. So that's really cool. And Ryan's always been really good about that too. So huge congratulations over to him. Just to bring it back to Star Wars, just very quickly, one thing that we did talk about, and I do you know go listen to the the interview and, and listen to the episode. But we committed, at least I committed, <laughs> I signed us up yeah. for this officially, but. We talked about coming on the his show and talking about the parallels between the screen screen franchise and Star Wars franchise. So uh, we've both seen most of the movies. I, don't, I have not seen the latest one. I don't think you have, unless you t you did and didn't tell me. No, I've not seen the not seen the most recent, but I've seen all the other ones. Yeah. Okay, so at some point we'll get caught up. But there are actually a lot of parallels in from the franchise perspective, right? And the the meta of like you know, sequels and prequels and the requels and all that. I mean, it all fits right into Star Wars. And so what we're going to do is at some point this year, early next year, I'm not sure we haven't really ended when it's going to be. Uh, we're going to go on there and kind of talk about <clears throat> the, the, again, the, the parallels that exist between the two franchises of Scream and Star Wars. So it's kind of like the mending or the blending of both of those worlds and should be a lot of fun. I can't wait to talk Star Wars. It's pretty crazy. I think, I think you first floated that over to us over a year ago. And we were, we were yeah. all in. We're like, yeah, let's do it. And just schedules and everything just never yeah, quite timing. lined up. 
So it's exciting to get that kind of renewed, renewed energy, especially with the new movie coming out. It's always, it's always fun and yeah. be able to get in front of a different crowd of people and have a different conversation and blending star Wars with, with something that's less familiar to us, but still like interesting and exciting. Yep. And it's really cool. Some of the parallels, even with family and things like that, especially early on in the screen franchise were really, you know, really cool to think about when it comes uh, compared to star Wars. So mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of, it's a lot of interesting synergies there. And speaking of, Speaking of synergies, yes, we'd like to uh, do a special shout out to all of our Patreon members, in particular, now part of the tribe members, Mike, Rob, Lauren, Dante, Rist, Justin, Jackson, Shark, Man, Dan, Daz, Isabella, Uncle Leon, and Josh C. And of course, our most astute members of the Delusion of Grandeur tier, Rod and Kathy. Thank you all so much. If you are curious about Patreon, either just getting early access to shows or exclusive content, cantinacast.com slash Patreon is where you can go to find all of the information about that. If you would like to join us during one of our live streams, which we do twice a week, typically is on Sundays and Thursdays. And so this Thursday is going to be Mandalorian. And then, of course, next Sunday, we'll do the full recap of episodes 15 and 16 of The Bad Batch. Cantinacast.com slash YouTube. And you can be like one of these amazing people in our chat right now. Steph, Lauren, Jonathan, Sky, Qui-Gon, Jay, and Alex. We see the folks in the background. If you want to come say hi, we would love to hear you. And yeah, come pay us a visit. We'd love to interact with you. We like to throw your comments up on screen. And if you have great thoughts and things like that, we like to bring those to the forefront on air. To the people who listen to the show, we try not to make it all about the live stream of the YouTube folks. We, we get that, but uh, hopefully you'll come out and have a chance to meet with us. We usually at about 9 p.m. Central Time on yeah. Sundays and Thursdays. Yep. Okay, well, let's do this. Let's talk about Tipping Point, which I guess you could consider the penultimate episode of this season because, uh, you know, tonight or early in the morning, 2 a.m. Central uh, we will get the final two episodes back to back. So it's all over tomorrow morning. And I'm staying up for both of those. I think, um, the runtime has been leaked at 50 minutes for both episodes. Like total. So yeah, combined. Okay. <clears throat> so you subtract, uh, what is so it? It's uh, consistent with what we've had then basically. Pretty much. So it's about, it's about what we thought. And the show has been rock solid in that like 25, 26 yeah. minutes. Uh -huh. It's like a half hour show. So yep. it's fun. So that will be out tonight, but uh, what are your, I guess, give me your thoughts here on this episode, because I felt like this was, there were, I mean, everything was kind of pointing, again, like I said in the intro, everything's pointing to Tantus. I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, it was good ref and refreshing to see Crosshair at least come around to the idea that the Empire's not, they're not good people. I'm not willing to say he's going to be the good guy again. I think that actually is more interesting if he's not, because it gives him more growth there. But, uh, but yeah, I've got a lot of questions because I don't know where, how this is going to end. This is kudos to them. They've not, either it's going to be amazing and because, because they've never, they've not really signaled a whole lot or it could, I hope it doesn't fall flat because, you know, it, it well, I don't know. What do you, what are your, I'll, I'll kind of elaborate on what I mean there in just a little bit. What are your opening thoughts here on the episode? I really liked the episode. And again, like we talked at the top of the show, this was a, this was that transition episode that we were hoping for the last couple of weeks that we thought we were going to get, where we would start to really point, get a real clear direction. Like, okay, here's how they're going to get to Tantas. Here's where all the things are going to start coming together. Yes, we still have some mystery items. We have some things that don't that don't quite fit together yet. That's totally cool, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's it's we finally get that that movement right, and it's in it's a, a way that we thought was pretty reasonable. Right, last week we debated a little bit about. What would pull them off of Pabu? Would it be the Empire coming in and just you know wrecking shop, or would they leave on their own accord? And I really like that. That's the way that we're leaning. We're leaning towards that. You know, Echo. You know, saving clones again. It, it definitely supported something you've been touting all season. Like, hey, let's rescue our brothers. It's about our brothers less so than you know building a rebellion type of thing. Which I, I like that that idea as well. You know, but being able to say, okay, Echo has a problem. You know who can solve it. You know, check out yeah. the beats while his while tech resolves it, and so. <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, you're, you're welcome for that. By the way, that's, <laughs> that's free of charge. Yeah. yeah, that's that's vanilla ice for you, buddy. But it's cool. That's how we got. That's how we get. You know, that's how we get that that energy to say, okay, now Hunter and company they have a choice to make, and they yeah. get to make the choice. And I like that they're still struggling with what to do anyway. Like his conversation with with Shep, of saying, you know, you know, like it's clear that they're not sure they want to stay. But Hunter's kind of leaning this this direction now, so I'm I'm excited to talk about that with you tonight. About you know what what's all of the emotions kind of going through Hunter? This conflict as well, right? Of what's best for the family when you just see how everyone is integrating with this society and how well they're doing. Even though we didn't get fee in this episode, you know we still have 
you know, a lot of these great moments here about how they're fitting in. They, they really do can't, they really can't carve out a, a life here, mm -hmm. you know? So I really like how that that's really going. I, I think that this is a, I thought this was a really good episode. I really liked it. The intensity of the crosshair scenes, you know, the, the, the questioning of Emery a little bit. Now there was a lot of the questions I have about Emery all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it, it's a, it was just a nice blend of everything. And you just have this really good bad guy in Hemlock. It's just, you could just tell there's no hold bars. He's just, what he wants is what he wants and he'll do anything to get it. And I just love characters like that. It's important, I think, in this in the day and age where we like to have a lot of gray area and we like to have a, a, some ambiguity. I think it's still really comforting in some ways to have someone that you, you identify as the bad guy and you can root against that person and you don't have to feel bad about it. Yeah, You don't have exactly. to feel like there's a redemption arc on the way, on the way around the corner, right? Yeah. It's like, no, they're, they're just a terrible human being right, right? right? or a terrible person in general. So it's okay. We can hate that, that person and we can love to hate them and it's fantastic. Right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll kind of pause there. Well, I was going to say, I was going to agree with you. Like I'm all for the morally gray characters. I re really like the morally gray characters. Morally conflicted. Yes. Yeah. How about that? There, there, there seems to be more and more of those uh, these days and, and, that, and that's fine, but like, there's just something pure <laughs> and innocent about Somebody who's just evil and you want them dead and, and you know they're never going to be good and they're always going to do the wrong thing. And that's Hemlock. And they've, we've got a lot of, we've actually got a lot of great characters like that in Star Wars, if you think about really it. Really do, yeah. So uh, it's, it's good. And, that, and I think that kind of speaks to the, the pure fairy tale fantasy, you know, stories that George Lucas was trying to tell good versus evil. It's really what it came down to for him. Um, so that said, yeah, Hemlock is a great character. I would like to see him extend. I mean, we're coming up to the last episode and I'm not saying he's going to pass, but they've done enough already, especially this whole thing about, you know, we'll get into it a little bit later, but him essentially making himself immune to that poison. Right. That's a, that's a, that's a piece that either they're giving it to us for like deeper character uh, analysis or deeper character uh, storytelling design, whatever. But, you know, it, it's one of those things that maybe that comes up a little bit later, but I guess the point is, They've done so many things with him so far that it would be a shame if we lose him in the next two episodes. Like, I'd like to see him carry it over into season three in some way. Uh, but this episode also, one thing I just want to quickly point out, <clears throat> there are a lot of like little cameos, or I wouldn't necessarily call them cameos, but just names that popped up or people that popped up. We got Tarkin in this episode. Gregor was in this episode. Uh, I know you got it in the show notes, but I'd like peed myself when they played the four, <laughs> first four notes of the Imperial March, right? Yeah. Uh, in, at the very beginning. So it is, I mean, this is, it, this feels good. Like it feels like we're going, we're heading in the right direction going into, you know, the last two episodes or last mega episode, if you want bundled episode, I guess the only thing that uh, I'm still, and maybe we'll see, we'll see how, how I feel at the end of this, these, the final episodes here, but it just, you know, I was wondering how it was going to feel at this point about looking back on the other, at this point, what, 14 episodes? And, you know, was it really worth it? Did it take too long to get here? Where was the story going? Where, you know, what was really all about? What was it going to be about? And I don't know. I, I mean, I feel a little conflicted at times. Like every episode was awesome. But I do just wonder, like, how much we could have spent doing other things. And did this feel like it was elongated too much or, and, and all that? And I get it. I mean, it's character building. It's story building, it's world building. There's also creating the stakes. I never felt like anything was filler, but I don't know. I'll see how I feel at the end. And we'll certainly come back and talk about that. But, you know, two episodes left. Hmm. Yeah, that'd be a great Patreon episode. I think once we get out of celebration and we are able to kind of let this digest and be able to watch the series, you know, in totality, right? And just kind of start to finish and just binge watch it. Because I'm with you. I think, I think some of the things are going to be positives if I just kind of think about it a little bit forward. It had a lot of time to breathe, had a lot of time to take its time and develop certain things and show us characters that in, in positions and situations that we, that they wanted to show us and that they needed to show us. There wasn't a lot of filler. There was always meaning in a lot of it. We'll see how much of that was a payoff. But today, what I want to talk about at the very end is I want to come back around and see what this means for the future of the Bad Batch in general. You know, not, not so much of just the, the season here, but just the future yeah. as well, because I think right. there's some signs here that we might be pointing to that you know, I have questions about whether or not this, this guarantees some things and going forward or not. Yeah, and if I haven't said it already, overall, I mean, it's a great episode. I really enjoyed it. And I mean, the crosshair stuff has just been prime Star Wars as far as I'm concerned this whole season. And we got a lot more of it this, this episode. Absolutely. Okay, well, let's get into the, the kind of the breakdown here. 
quick recap. So directed by Sal Ruiz, written by Jennifer Corbett and my, uh, Matt N McNavitz again. So again, consistent writing staff again throughout the season, uh, but a different director. And I think this was a, a little bit different direction position, uh, a little bit directive on that one, but I liked the style and the, the cinematic quality brought to this one too. Yeah, no, for sure. Good stuff there from all of them. And again, same, most of the same players, same crew. So that all stays very consistent. Uh, but out of the gate, um, you know, we get to, we've got these prisoners, Hauser's immediately shown. We hadn't seen him in like since season one being transported away. And on that transport, we know, the audience knows they're being taken to Tantus. Well, I don't know for sure. I mean, the assumption is that they're going to Tantus for whatever it is, but they could be going somewhere else. Right. But uh, we get this little rescue mission that happens at the very beginning. And this is where I was like freaking out because, I mean, Gregor has such a unique laugh that when it yeah. happened, like they didn't have to say <laughs> his name. I mean, if you watch Clone Wars and, and Star Wars Rebels, you knew exactly who that was. How cool was it that he was in commando gear, though? Yeah. Well, he got promoted. Because he's, I mean, he's pretty much just a grunt most of the time there. But yeah, uh, Hauser clones, all the other clones. You caught one of the clones' name, right? He had Fireball. Did you catch the other clone's name that they named? Nemec. Nemec, yeah. That was a, I thought that was probably intentional with Andor. Yeah, yeah. What's the connection in your mind, though? Like, is it just a, like an Easter egg? I think it's just an Easter egg. Yeah. Okay. I wonder when these were written and stuff and whether or not that was already on the slate and, and all that. Maybe not. Maybe it's spelled different. I didn't even check the spelling. Was it listed in the credits at all? N-E-M-E-C was okay. how it was spelled in the in the uh, subtitles. Gotcha. But yeah, I mean, it was good to see the clones in action. I mean, I could have a whole series about these guys, right, going in. I mean, this could be a series in itself. Maybe that's where the Bad Batch is going. We've Wait, kind of speculated that. A whole series about clones? You mean like the Clone Wars or, or <laughs> Bad Batch? Or... No, I mean like clones going in. Sorry, I should, have been more, I, was, I should have been more specific. I could have a whole series about the clones rescuing other clones, just like Mission of the Week kind of thing. Maybe not a whole, you know, five seasons, but, yeah. uh, you know, seeing Echo and Rex and maybe Cody, you know, and Havoc and Gregor and, you know, getting all these guys together and just showing this kind of elite team, that would be really something to watch, you know? So... But yeah, I enjoyed their, I mean, they go in, they disable the ship, they take out the shields, they take out the weapons. It's pretty much just a floating, you know, iceberg at that point. And, uh, you know, boarding, the way they boarded the ship was all very cool. I mean, just, it was great to see the clones in action and, and you know, there to liberate their own folks. Uh, I just wonder, like, again, we've got an Imperial officer who kills himself. And so, I mean, this kind of, this trend kind of started, what, with, the Mandalorian, right? And now we've right. seen it in Mandalorian a couple of times. We've seen it in Clone Wars. Uh, yeah, I got a question though. Mm -hmm. I guess these, are, do you think it's just some Imperial officers or certain divisions that are doing this? Or do you think this is just something that was always there? And yeah, maybe they've kind of, I'm going to call it a retcon. It's really not a retcon because it's not a definition, but they've just kind of established this as this, this is being the new norm for, the remnants of the empire, you know, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a part of operation cinder that was never, you know, we didn't, was never talked about, but now we're just starting to kind of get clues and bits and pieces that this is part of the MO for them. Yeah, maybe. I think it goes to this clandestine operation, right? I think this is where the, the conversation that Tarkin has with, with Hemlock a little bit later on gives a little more clarity to why they've got the, these fail safes. And, and, you know, so your protocol is if you get boarded, you erase everything immediately. And if you get captured, you hit the kill switch, right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 you snap the capsule, you get shocked, you die and long live the empire type of thing. Yeah. So I think this is sowing the seeds of what we end up seeing in Andor and what we seeing in Mandalorian and then those behaviors later on. But is it uh, yeah. So is it tied or one way or the other? I don't know, but it's definitely these clandestine operations. These, these off the books type of uh, programs that we're not supposed to have, that we don't want people learning about. We have to keep it quiet because it would have a, it would just, the optics alone would be horrible, but then the actual backlash and what people want to do, like your empire starts crumbling around you and you have to move all of your plans forward much faster to close the iron grip around everybody, right? Yeah, right. And they're just not ready for that quite yet. And again, the things that they're doing, they know they can't do this. They, they know they can't be you know, saying we're decommissioning clones, but then transporting them to the secret location and doing all these secret things. The Zillow Beast, right, is another example of that. This is a location that needs to be top secret. And you put all of the different protocols in place to make sure that it stays that way, regardless of what the cost of that is. And you're going to have some losses along the way. And again, Hemlock has it, I mean, not to jump ahead, but I mean, in the conversation with Tarkin, right, he's, he's like, we, we need to be focusing on the 
the reason why this is happening like how are what are the leaks from like why are we why are we so prone to this type of thing happening and it's happening with a more frequent pace now right yeah you know and so if you if we could just handle it better we, we wouldn't have this issue and hey i've got a solution right so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later later on but yeah i think it's, it's definitely sowing the seeds for what we see in later content and and i like that to an extent yep yeah you know, but, but we're seeing a lot of it you're right i mean we're seeing a lot of it uh we've got a i think a new viewer here uh tom uh, hey, got a quick question. I wonder what their armor is. Are they part of a battalion? Uh, speaking to, I guess, about Gregor and those clones. Yeah, there didn't seem to be any kind of cohesion to what they had. Fireball had like uh, kind of a green, like almost like Commander Greer or Grease yeah. uh, gear, right? It was more green, like they yep. were on Kashyyyk, but he had stripes across his face. Gregor had white clone commander armor with some yellow stripes on his right pauldron. Not pauldron, but right, uh, oh gosh, whatever it's called. Yeah, you know, like you're on your armor your forearm things. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, they all kind of, and then Echo is still dressed like Echo. So I don't, I don't know that they had any kind of rhyme or reason to what they had. It just seems like they're just using the gear they had because that's what they that's had. What they yeah. yeah. It's not like they have a lot of resources at this point. They're, they're kind of hiding out in one place and that's about it right now. Bam brace. There you go. Thank you, Dale. As yeah. always. As always, the, Dale's coming in for us. Appreciate the support there. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Like it, I mean, one, it's probably, it's it makes it easy for us to identify them, you know, on screen as the characters where, yeah. where it's probably where it's coming from mostly. But you know, are they some kind of logical battalion? Probably. I mean, I would imagine they've gathered groups and put, paired them together and, and sent, you know, people that worked really well together on missions. And it would make sense that all of these guys are, you know, kind of most of these are from the 501st anyway. So it would make sense that they would be there. We get a little flavor of that from Echo when he's talking to Hunter about what they're up to. But again, it. It sounds like it's pretty covert. They've got they've got plants inside. They've got some that are underground. Yeah. So is it getting organized? Yes. How organized is it? A little unclear at this point. And it's still very early days, right? So we have to assume that Echo's really probably only been gone, call it six months, something like that. Right. Maybe maybe a little bit longer than that. We'll maybe call it upwards of a year, but probably only about six months or so. So it's not like it's been a lot. And Rex has been working in the background, of course, as well. But we don't know how well organized this thing really is to see if they've really got organized ranks or if, like you've said, it's really just more broken down kind of squads and strike teams of sorts, I think. It's kind of how I equated it, too. They were more strike team oriented. I'm sending a pun right now on the maybe, chat. Maybe they are vambracing their individuality. So Steph said maybe they're embracing their individuality. And I said maybe they're vambracing. So this is where lately in the edits oh. that I've been doing, I'll slip in like some crickets or some other sounds <laughs> in the background. Well, we're, we're losing viewers right now as we speak. So, uh, yeah. So you're welcome for that. Uh, okay. So back to the show there. <laughs> uh, let's see. So dude kills himself and, uh, we cut over to, well, the, the, the empire shows up and this is where we got the big, you know, essentially star destroyers showing up and we get the four notes of the Imperial March. That's, That's all we excited. get, but I'll take it. Man, they were, they were, you talk about like punching the music though. It was yeah. like, bomb, bomb, bomb. Yes. Like, hell yeah. yeah. Finally. It was but good it, but uh, uh, Echo is getting a download of the data, right? So they're trying to mm. erase the data. He does capture some of it. So of course, all signs you're like, okay. Who's the only person that could decrypt this? Exactly. Tech. Right. Which leads us to tech. Uh, but before we go there, uh, we get to we go back to Mount Tantus and Crosshair is kind of being... He's being moving, essentially being moved and be tortured, right? The, to, to kind of recap, they're trying to get information about Omega because they need Omega to make Nala Sace talk or work for them in whatever kind of cloning project they've got going on. And so the idea here is that they're going to just go ahead and torture. At first, I thought they were going to be taking him back there to turn him into one of these new. Yeah, the, yeah, the dark, phase, dark zero, uh, dark trooper phase zero. Yeah, phase zero troopers. Whatever conditioning program, yeah. Right, and I think that's maybe what they were kind of alluding to at the very end. I don't know, maybe not. It, that would be kind of a, a weird uh, thing for him. But there, there were two things in that, though. So yeah. that's one of them. That was one point that it seemed like, okay, we're getting away from that a little bit, but there are there's some indicators that might not, that might actually be happening. The other question I had for you, though, is where is Nalase? Like what, I, I, I would have thought that she would have surfaced in, in these episodes that we've spent on Tantus, or at least yeah. in this one, that she would have, you know, been present. Maybe she'll show up in the finale, you know, two parter, but any any ideas about why why she's not being shown or what she's doing or I mean she's I, still alive, right? Yeah, I mean she's still alive. I think they that is I mean they've kind of alluded that there's only now two, you know, Kaminoans left and one's really smart and the other one's just a snake, you know, Politician. somebody's yeah, he's selling snake oil and he's car salesman. Technically three Kaminoans still alive, but yeah. 
Only who's two the, we care about. Who's the third one? Uh, the the other female Kaminoan that was the former treasurer office <laughs> or finance. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, and then there's Mark who's who's down in accounting, uh, but they don't really <laughs> need him for anything either. So with right. that, four of those four Kaminoans that are left. Yeah, I mean she's yeah, I mean she's they they can't get rid of her. I mean they're whatever she and that's the thing you think about it, right? You got Hemlock, you've got uh, Emery, you've got potentially people like Pershing, you've got other people. I mean, the, the the Empire is going to invest in this cloning project as much as they can. And for whatever reason, it does feel like they're kind of stuck, right? And that's why Nala Say is so important. That's why they're keeping her alive. So, yeah, I would say she's imprisoned and she'll probably, well, she will pop up in this. I mean, it's almost yeah. a guarantee that she's going to pop up in one of these two episodes here in our but finale. No reason to until Omega shows up. Exactly. Yeah. Or until we know exactly what it is they want her to do. Right. I mean, at some point, uh, I would imagine that if, if this all goes as planned and they're going to continue on with the project with Nala say, you know, which, you know, I don't know how we get there, but uh, I would expect them to, to kind of spill the beans on, in terms of what they're going to, to do with her, or what they're going to ask her to do, which would kind of unveil their plans in that way. Uh, but yeah, I mean, as he's walking, I guess one of the things, and, and this is you know, he's walking through these hallways and he's looking left and right. And there's lots and lots of clones that are imprisoned. And later on, we get the, 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 the sense or further confirmation that more and more clones are kind of kicking back again, bucking up against the system, disobeying orders, not good soldiers. Yeah. So it, they're, they're definitely more and more of these clones that are being imprisoned. And so all of this doesn't, I mean, this is all kind of adding up, right? Maybe this is the tipping point here or him seeing, uh, you know, just what what's happening to the clones and how they're being treated. And this is all kind of, again, more wake up, more confirmation for us, but more confirmation for him, more revelation for him that maybe he did pick the wrong side here. Um, and we'll, I want to talk about that again a little bit later, but I do want to talk about kind of where his loyalties lie, because I have a, a, a theory, I think, based on the way this episode kind of played out. Um, but yeah, uh, he's waiting, Dr. Hemlock. And of course, Hemlock finally walks in, walks in and says, hey, you're not here for any other reason for than for us to punish you. And this can go one of two ways, you know, we can kill you. We can't, um, you know, he talks about giving him a clean slate this time, which that led me to think, okay, so maybe they are going to pull the information out of him or if he gets the information, once he gets the information out of him, either Crosshair willingly gives it up or it's re removed for him through interrogation. The clean slate, I think is putting him in part of that program and they don't say as much. It's not as explicit, but that was my theory. What did you think he was kind of hitting at there? I completely agree. I think it was a very, yeah, a subterfuge type of comment where it's just very misleading of, I'll give you the clean slate, but that means that you are in, in my program and you become a believer effectively, mm -hmm. you know, something along those lines of, it's just a bait and switch effectively. Give me what I want. I'll give you what you want. You just want your freedom, right? And Crosshair, I think Crosshair is probably like, wow, that is kind of what I want. But I think he, like you, to, to your point, when he's walking down the hall and he's seeing only clone troopers, you know, only clones that are around him. And again, we don't think that Crosshair really has a, and I think we get a little bit of this from Hunter later on. He doesn't really view them as his brothers necessarily. He doesn't, they don't really have a connection with them as the, as the, the regs you had with one another. Yeah. But I think he's seeing the trend. I mean, how many, you, you, he's been beaten over the head with it so many times, right? We had in the, the previous episode with him and with Mayday, you know, being called imperial property. And those themes are, are a verbatim used here again, right? Of, you know, Omega is clone, is, is a clone, therefore she's imperial property, which equates to him as well. It equates to everybody in that hallway, anybody that they're transporting and what they're doing and that they're not telling them what they're there for is just more and more examples of the empire just doing what they want. And they don't care about the individuals and they certainly don't care about the clones specifically. Yeah. And they're only going to use them for their own motives. And I don't know how much, I don't know how much Crosshair has seen that maybe we haven't seen from Crosshair to see if he has any other ideas of what they're doing, but he's, he's not stupid either, right? He, he sees yeah. that there is something going on that doesn't feel right. And they don't ask many questions. And Hemlock doesn't really ask many questions to Hemlock's credit. And this is why I like the character, especially to hate him, right? You love to hate characters like Hemlock. He asks you once and there's no debate. There's no conversation. There's no, come You're on right. and tell me. There's no, you know, don't make me do this. It's just, all right, light them up, you know, yep. lay them on the table and <laughs> yeah. let's just, let's, let's Open them up, go. Folks. We're going in. Yeah. I mean, just, it just is what it is. Right. And that's, it, it's great to, well, it's, it sucks to see torture on screen like that. Right. And this was probably pretty well done in that respect for a, a semi kids kind of show, but it's great to see that from a character saying, okay, 
that's a uh, no debate. I run a tight ship here. If you want to answer the question, we'll see how this goes. And we'll come back and revisit later on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See in 20, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. When he was on that chair, um, you could get the sense of so a little bit of music happening there. What were you picking up on that? There is a, it's a very harsh, metallic, heavy metal, distorted sound. It's only, it's only briefly there, but it comes again later on when they do the interrogation of, of Crosshair again. And at first glance, you think it's, oh, it's just kind of Crosshair's dark and brooding music. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure it's the Dark Trooper music from Mandalorian. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty positive. It's very, very similar. It's in the same vein. And yeah. I know the crosshair music is a little bit similar to that, but it really feels like it's that real crunchy, distorted, mm-hmm. you know, like overly, it's almost like a, it's, it's peaking, right? For those who know, those what that mean or clipping, right? When you, clipping, when you, yeah. yeah, when you have too much sound and you, you get staticky and things like that, right? So it's just dirty. And I'm pretty sure if you, if you listen to that and crank it up, it feels a lot like that dark trooper, that, that vibe and that theme, that theme yeah. there. Well, and that would make sense because I think uh, they haven't all but said that that is actually part of the Dark Trooper program. So, Right, and, and to your point, I think that's where it's leading, right? If, if that's the clean slate, that I mean, all the little breadcrumbs they're dropping here all seem to be suggesting that that's the angle this is going to. And that's kind of where my point was for, you know, towards the end of the show is, given we only have a couple of episodes left, does this almost guarantee we're going to have a season three? Yeah, I think so. I mean, kind of feels that way, right? Yeah, I would, I would, and I think we talked about this too in the last episode, a couple episodes ago. I'm thinking four seasons is probably right. They really wanted to extend it. Maybe they go to a fifth, but I think what's ultimately going to drive how many seasons this series is is going to be what what are the bigger plans that Filoni and Favreau have? Because I think some of this stuff is going to play into the, even though we're years before all of that timeline. Um, I think they're kind of laying down some things, and there's some intriguing things that could still play out with Omega, you know, still being around, you know, maybe we see Grogu during the series at some point. I don't know. Again, I'm just throwing ideas. I'm not saying any of these are good or I like them, but there's a lot of potential here that they've done from all of the storytelling that they've done uh, through Star Wars television over the last two, three years now. Yeah, sadly, I'm a little concerned about the future of the show just from a viewership. I'm hoping that it's got the numbers because I think that's going to matter a whole lot more, but yeah, we can get back to the story though. We'll, yeah. we'll focus less on that part right now. Well, so yeah, so they begin the torturing. The only thing I'll add in here is we kind of get that very, that we get the first, maybe not the first inclination, because I think we may have seen it in the last time, the last time we saw Crosshair, but from Emery, you know, she's an interesting character. It, on one hand, it just feels like, okay, she really is in this for, you know, the science and so, much like Pershing, this is getting a little uncomfortable, not exactly what she signed up for, right? Or they weren't, in, they didn't, and they didn't, weren't very, transparent about what she was going to be doing here on Tantus when she was assigned to Tantus. Maybe that's one angle. I've heard other people, you know, speculate of that. Oh, maybe she's a clone or she's like some offspring of, you know, Omega or she's, I mean, sure. Okay. I guess they could go that route, but that would be a big kind of surprise to throw at us without a lot of buildup in, in all that. And I would really question about where that would even go or why we need to do that at this point. But then the other just pure thing about it is she's just a good person. Like she's a, a person who does have feelings for him. And I'm not shipping them. I'm not saying that because although I'll be the first to do that, but no, not in this, not in this case, but I do feel like she does feel bad for him. Right. And she does feel like this isn't really the right thing to do. And on top of that, I'm going to potentially risk my life career by saving it because I think she does do that a little bit later. I mean, she gives him meds to kind of help with the, uh, the torture, the interrogation that's happening because he was about to die. They were really kind of pushing him to that point. So what do you think? Is she just got a soft heart? Do you think there's something more in here? Do you think there's something that she wants from him? I mean, there's, it could go a lot of different ways, but. Yeah, she's interesting because I think some people are probably leaning a little bit too much on her accent. I think that's where the clone idea is coming from. And I don't necessarily like that idea. I think that's just too on the nose for some of that. Mm-hmm. But I think, and I agree with most of what you're saying too. I think that she's in it for the science. It's more of that, like kind of like Pershing, right? You just, you're there for that breakthrough. It feels like you're doing something really unique. Is it morally potentially wrong or ambiguous? Yes, but you don't necessarily have that. You don't have that bone in your body that tells you this is vehemently wrong. You might have a feeling, but it's like, no, this is science. This is like, we're just pushing this forward. I'm here because this is really, this is groundbreaking. Right. It is very much a Kaminoan type of thing, which I can, again, I understand another correlation there as well. But 
you're right. She uses his name. She doesn't use his number. She doesn't call him CT9904. She calls him Crosshair every single time. And I think yep. it's like four times this episode, right? Yeah. That's that's not to be taken lightly, right? And so some of that could be that she's just trying to relate to him or, or manipulate him to get him to calm down and, and be compliant. Or it could be that, yes, yeah, she feels some amount of compassion. Again, maybe not shipping them, although I, I'm actually kind of okay with that in this case because I think they'd be, they'd be kind of a cute couple. He's the only one that doesn't have love in some way, right? right. So yeah. Crosshair needs love too. She's kind of hot from an animated st standpoint. So why okay. not? Okay, easy now, easy now. Well, I'm just It's, it's the goggles right? that's doing it for you, I'm sure. Dude, those red, I want those red glasses. I know you lie. do. Every time I see her, I'm thinking there's Jonesy in his goggles. Dude, totally want those, yeah. yeah. But anyway, uh, so, but it's a, it, it's interesting though that she does seem to show him that compassion. I thought a lot about what you were saying though, about whether... She set him up to be able to try to escape, but then she worked so hard at telling him you can't escape. And so I don't like, I, it almost like she didn't mean to, she gave him, she administered some sort of medicine or drug to him. Don't really know what it was, but they made a point to show us that she did give him something. Did she anticipate the stormtrooper laying their blaster down to secure the restraints? But again, when she took the, the restraint off of his head and put her you know, hand to the head, now granted she was examining him, that still felt compassionate to me yeah, yeah, in some way. Right. And I don't think reading too much into that one because she, she was gentle about it. It wasn't just like a, an exam, right. Or just an emotionless type of exam. And she wasn't crying or anything like that, or you know, going over her data pad and being concerned or anything like that. So I don't want to get too, you know, go too far on the deep end, but there's definitely signs there of she wants kind of what's best for him, but she doesn't want him to suffer. But by extension, that means that you need to comply. You need to do what they're told. And she doesn't have anything. But I think some of it is like, there's no way to escape here. She's just being matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Like you're going, you will probably get hurt and it'll probably be worse for you. So just comply and, you know, and you'll, you'll probably get out of this alive because you won't yeah. like, and she knows it. She's probably seen this, right? Hemlock's not going to treat you well. If you don't comply, he will, he will do things you won't enjoy. Yeah. Right. He's, he's not above. Yeah, you know, and I don't even know, like, yes, they need Omega. I I feel like even though they need Omega, I think Hemlock is like, at some point, I'm not going to sit here and, you know, keep him alive for keeping him alive's sake. Like, he, we can just kill him. It's fine. I mean, essentially, that's what he does at the very end, just double the, inter the interrogation. He, he's got to know the risk. If he dies, he dies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Rocky five all over again. If he dies, he dies kind of thing. So, okay, so we get a, let's, let's quickly go and to, back to, I guess, what, the clone quarters, headquarters or whatever. I mean, they're kind of hiding in plain sight again here on Coruscant, although it's a pretty massive planet, I get it, uh, or city, however you want to look at it. Right. But yeah, they're essentially hiding in plain sight there. Um, and we got to see Hauser, we got to see Senator Chuchi, which I think we talked about, you know, maybe she would come back since they kind of established her as, as a prominent character, or at least put a spotlight on her in that one episode. So. Uh, it looks like she's, you know, true to her word in helping the clones and give them a voice and do whatever they ca they can. I think she's now getting caught up in this whole rescue mission, though, which. Yeah, she's in this underground railroad. Different. Yeah, that's a little yeah. bit. That's a little deeper in. She's, right. She's becoming the early seeds of rebellion here. You know? Exactly. I mean, going up in front of the Senate and fighting for rights and equal pay and all that. That's one thing. But now you're harboring, you know, people that are, would be, you know, uh, I guess uh, anti-imperials or. You know, and it's, it's basically trafficking, right? I mean, yeah. and, and again, it's 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 undermining the system of what you're going to do, and it's doing the right thing. So again, it, it's true to character, and it's true. Now, should she be involved in it specifically? No, but should she be aware of it so she can bring it to light? Maybe yes. You know, I think on, on the surface you want to say yes, you know, strongly and, and lots of conviction. But also she's saying she's starting to see what happens when you speak out against the empire right mm -hmm. so what do you do with that what's the right thing to do about that and they're still trying to figure that part of it out and then we we get into the whole thing about uh you know echo you know gotta go decrypt the logs and that leads them to tech you had a thing in here and i saw it i mean she puts her hand yeah. on this is gonna be two times in one episode i know dude you're getting soft i am you're getting super soft here they're finally wearing down on you lauren and and stuff here but uh, but yeah, I mean, there was a moment when she did that. I don't, I didn't see anything in it. I mean, sure. If you want to ship them too, go right ahead. But now you're getting into my territory. I would e say echo needs love too. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to work. That guy is going to take a strong woman. 
or person. But, uh, but yeah, <laughs> we'll, I saw, we won't touch that one too yeah, closely. No. <laughs> she put her she put her hand on the shoulder. I think it was just like you know she tells him to be careful. It yeah. seemed it seemed a little more delicate. And granted, she's a she's she's petite. She's very soft spoken. <laughs> she's very you know she's very caring and compassionate. So those are all things that could be misconstrued. And Echo is completely oblivious, by the way. So it's not like he's like getting no. like googly eyed or anything like that. Right. I don't think he could get googly eyed. I don't think the implants and everything would allow him to be. No, I think he's. Yeah. That he smiled later on in the episode was a complete shocker, right? Yeah. Like a big smile. Uh, but no, it, it was just, it was gentle. It was compassionate. It was caring. And I'm willing to ship them too. All right. I'm in a, I'm in a mood. We're going to ship them all. <laughs> two everything two. must go. We're shipping everything. Everything must go. Um, yeah, I think she was just kind of giving him a hand because he doesn't have a hand. Okay, so <laughs> let's go to the next scene. Where, what are we back on? <laughs> Sorry. All right. Tantus torture. So this is, uh, well, we talked about all this, right? So the doctor stops, gives him the thing, and she lets him live. But, you know, <clears throat> it, the only thing we didn't talk about in the scene here is he doesn't, I mean, Echo is someone, I'm sorry, Echo. Crosshair is someone that I think in that moment, I mean, he was pretty much a caged animal trapped in a corner. He's got to be feeling that way. I mean, he pulled that blaster on them and shot all three in, in a matter of seconds. He does not shoot her immediately. Yeah. Right. And to me, it's to me, that feels like it is a little bit out of character, but I'm okay with it because that tells me that he's, a, he knows he's, he's feeling the compassion that's coming from her. Right. Cause there's no reason why he would keep her alive. Like I'm trying to think like, what was it she was going to offer? I mean, outside of the badge, but he could have just taken that off her dead body. Right. right? So there was really no reason. So he had to have hesitated on killing her, which means that, yes, he's at least picking up that she's not particularly one of them, I guess. I'll call it that, even though she is. But, uh, but yeah, it just reinforces that, that, that he's at least feeling that and sensing it. So Yeah, I agree. There's something a little bit different about her. He has treated her with some amount of, I don't know, treated him like a human being on some level, right? And he recognizes that. And again, does Crosshair, is he... Is he knowingly making different decisions because he doesn't want to be like what he has been a part of with the Empire? Mm -hmm. And it's moments like that that are really key changes for him to where he doesn't shoot first and ask questions later or just, well, no, she did this. She was part of all this, so therefore she's guilty and, you know, put her down like yeah. the rest of them. So I liked that there was pause and that she was trying to help him think clearly and that she was talking to him like a human being and treating him as well in the given the situation as well as he could be expected to be treated and i like that he made the the decision to switch to stun and then stun her instead yeah i mean she was she echoed Cobb vanth think this through think yeah. this through yeah uh, from season two uh which i'm sure wasn't intentional as well oh, i'm sure yeah yeah but uh but yeah he stuns her so it doesn't kill her stuns her puts her down um and we move on so he starts going and this is i guess what we're calling the prisoner escape at this point um, it was interesting. He was missing a lot of shots. And I think we can explain that right, pretty easily. Wasn't, I mean, he's just tortured and nearly died. So I would expect him not to, to heavily, uh, was heavily drugged. Yeah. Yeah. Heavily drugged is probably part of it as well. Um, yeah. And then he sends off this, uh, this message about plan 88, right? Plan 88, you have to hide there after he, I listened to this a few times. That part didn't get sent though. Only the first part did. Oh, is that where I didn't catch that piece if that was. A yeah, only plan 88 made it across. They shut down mm. the rest of it before he could get it out. OK, well, that sucks. But when I listen to it, uh, you know, he almost it does sound like he's trying to say Omega. He says, oh, like you can hear that very first part of it. Yeah, uh, as well. So I agree. Either way. And I guess where, uh, you know, then he gets gas, he falls down and Hemlock walks in and, and does the whole you know, uh, Princess Bride thing. We're like, I've built up an immunity for this to this poison over the years. But I, a question for you though, so and we can talk about this now. Is just the where is his where is Crosshair's loyalty at this point? Like, I don't. I'm not ready to say that he's going to just jump back over and everything's fine. I wouldn't expect that anyways. But I don't think he's okay with like his loyalty doesn't seem to be to the Empire. Um, I don't know that his loyalty is to Rex and Echo and those guys yet. I, for me, it feels like it really is like if he was to come back to the team, I think he would do what his team, what the Bad Batch wanted, whatever that may be. But beyond that, I don't know that he's got a whole lot, of, at least right now, I don't think he's thinking anything more than that. Now, this could put a pretty big sour taste in his mouth and maybe he wants 
revenge on the empire. And man, you got to talk about somebody again. We talked about this a while back too, where he's been over there now on that side. He's got intel on how things operate and what things are like in the new empire. Right. So that would be somebody that would be pretty potentially powerful to have on your side. So they could send him on, you know, some of these covert operations and, and that sort of thing and just kind of keep them dark and gray and not necessarily be one of the good guys, but still be part of the bad badge. I think all that kind of fits in with somebody like Crosshair. I guess what I'm saying is I want him to have the edge, right? But I don't want him to be the good guy. I don't want to see him smile, you know, leave that for the echoes and the techs and hunters and Gregors and all that. But uh, yeah, I still want him to have that edgy feel. And we got it in spades in this series so far with him since he went over to the Empire. Yeah, we don't really know how much, like we know the clones are on the out and they're just being done dirty. So how much does he really know is maybe less clear? That would be interesting though, if there was, if there were things that he was picking up on, he's more perceptive than most. But yeah, there were a couple of things. I think one, he's backed into a corner. So he's like, he is, he's in self-preservation mode for, for some of this. I think that's a big motivator on it. But what I would like to think, kind of point number two, the, the thing I would like to believe is that and, and may, uh, to your point, to the, he just goes back with his family and feels like everything is fine and let's make our way forward. That's a little too much. That's a little too abrupt for me. But is he coming to the realization that they were right and that he was in the wrong and that he, he's, he has an opportunity to warn them and protect them in some way in order to make up for some of the things that he has contributed to and that he's been a part of? You know, specifically with them, especially the way that he's he's felt so conflicted about Omega, whether he was threatened by Omega or didn't understand why they were, you know, why they were putting all of their faith in this this child that has completely ripped their family apart and from his perspective for a while at least, completely obliterated their world. And he kind of hung it on her. So it's a really big, it's a really big moment that he is, you know, I'm with you. I think he was going to say Omega, you have to hide Omega, you have to get her safe. Yeah. You know, they're coming for her. So I like that he was finally kind of putting her, you know, first, but really the the family. And so I really like that. I like the idea though, that he is trying to atone in some way. Now, if he were to reunite with them, does it make everything better? Is he just welcome back in? No, there's a lot of bad blood. There's a lot of mistrust. There's a lot of things to work through. Is it possible? Yes. Would he go off on his own? Maybe, but I like the idea that they would work on it. Even mm -hmm. if it was difficult, even if they weren't necessarily a, a tight unit, you know, right off the bat, none of that's expected, but that the opportunity is there and that he is recognizing it, I think are great signs. And I like that a lot that he's, at least it seems like he's making that progress there and he's, he's recognizing that it, it was him, him that was in the wrong. Although given the circumstances and the situation, was he capable of making a different choice or a different decision? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. But they'll cross that bridge when they get there. Yep. Or burn it, by the way. Yeah. Choices. So, okay. So the, let's get to Pabu, the land of recovery. So we get to see them in the, this whole, you know, they're, they're fixing things up and everything's wonderful. Do you see Wrecker's like armor? He's like yeah. wearing something new finally. And I think Hunter was too, now that I recall. He's wearing like a, like Hunter's wearing kind of like a little shawl type of thing. I, I thought know. they had like a reddish orangish armor on though. Like it looks something, it looks similar to what you would wear on the island, I guess, but still yeah. armory. I don't know. It has changed a little bit. I don't know if I, I thought it changed before Pabu though, but maybe, maybe it has changed a little bit more. I don't know. Oh, okay. If it did, if it did, then I didn't catch that. I was thinking it was more of the influence of Pabu and, and, you know, still doing that, which is, I'm just, again, I keep beating this dead horse, but they've got to change their look. Okay, get rid of the bandana, go get the tat removed, dude. I don't know what to tell you at this point. Get a can, cut can too. I, can I pause here though and just break in? Cause the one thing that made me smile is in the background, like when, you know, when they're uh, before Shep and, uh, and uh, Hunter talk, mm -hmm. you know, we have the, the scene where Wrecker is, is fishing, right? When the boat pulls up kind of the intro, yeah. but when it pulls back, you can actually see Wrecker. They actually animated Wrecker, like hooking the fish that he ends up bringing up later. And so you can actually see him in the background, like, like he catches something. Oh, nice. I just like that. It is a really inconsequential detail, but when he comes sure. up with the fish, if you caught that, you're like, Hey, I actually saw him catch the fish. <laughs> And it's yeah. silly, I know, but it, it's little things like that. I like it when they, they pay attention to the background mm -hmm. and it's a part of the story too. And it it's just kind of fun if you're, if you just happen to watch, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think Riss, Riss is, I think it was before it was before, I think. So meaning, yeah, um, that was probably the case. He was probably wearing it. I, 
Alex says, didn't you wear a bandana for a good part of your early 20s? Okay, we're not going to talk about that. It was the 90s, man. Um, okay, so on Pabu, there's a, there's a line. So was, I think it's Shep says the line of he's making becoming an integral part of the, of the community, right? Talking about Rucker. And when he said that, I thought, oh, okay, well, that's, you know, they're kind of signaling that at some point this is where they will retire. They will retire. Hunter says as much, you know, hey, this is a very isolated. He's confirming what Echo says is like, hey, this is really out in the middle of nowhere. But, you know, I, I started thinking, too, do I really want all of them to retire here? And I, I think the short answer is no. Like, I think there's probably a place for everybody. But I, I do. I think for me, that was more of a signal that if anyone, like of all the people, I think Wrecker is like a definite. Like, this just seems like this is where he's going to go. And then it got me thinking about like, where would all the other clones go? Like do the bad batch at some point, did they stick together? And I don't think so. I mean, tech would probably be there because of fee. So maybe tech and wrecker should end up there, but uh, does it make end up there? Right. Does Hunter, I, I don't know. It, 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 there's really, I'm not asking you anything here. I just, it was just interesting that they mentioned it um, and uh, signaled it, I guess in some point, but I wrecker seems like he's fitting in right in and they keep hitting that pretty hard. Right. Yeah, and we talked a little bit about last week where it's the it's the setting up of the passing of time, right? So we'll be when we come back to Pabu, especially later on when we see it in the evening, you see the light. So it gives us an idea of how much time has passed because they've redeveloped some part of the lower levels of Pabu, right? Yeah. The island. And so we see that and we see that they have been valuable parts of the community, right? They have they've become, you know, part of the community and they're living there. They're actually an integral part of it. They they're valued. They like being there. It's becoming a home to them. So I think it's just, again, is it signaling that maybe where they want to be longer term? Maybe, but is it a sign that in general, that there is a life after being a soldier? And again, the, the, the conversation with Hunter and Shep about that too, of, of saying, am I saying his name right? Is it Shep? Is that right? Every time I hear that, I'm like, I'm talking about the three stooges or something. It's so like, my yes, there was weird. a, there was a stooge named Shep, but you're, well, Shep, you're I think it was right. Shep. Yeah. So. Yeah. But every time I hear it, anyway, so but I like that, you know, the conversation, you're like, hey, do you, what have you thought about, have you reconsidered staying here longer? So they've clearly talked about it. So again, helping time pass conversations, but it sounds like Hunter said, no, it's probably not a longer term, but it's clear he does, he is conflicted about it. He sees how Wrecker has done with it. He's probably seen how Omega interacts with the other kids, right? And the other people her age and that they don't have to worry about galaxy scale problems. They can focus on fixing problems at home if you know if you will like and you could put home in finger quotes if you'd like but that's the idea is like we're focusing on home problems now not solving the galaxy or running or hiding or fighting or doing jobs or getting abandoned and stranded and all of the stresses that go with all that other stuff like no we've actually feel like this is a place that it feels like home for us and that that's a it's got to be uncomfortable, right? And I like that Hunter continues to challenge it. It's an occupational hazard. And I think it's as much of a hazard for the people of Papu as it is for the sure. Batch, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. It's a good point. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, the challenge that he throws out there is like, are, is that all you are? Are you, is, is the only thing you are is a soldier? I mean, that, that's the question that he puts in front of it. And Hunter thinks about that. Like, uh, am I, is that all I am? Like what, you know, and this may go somewhere at some point, right? He develops other skills or figures out that he's got to do more. It's a tough question, right? You get that, plus you feel the responsibility of your family, but then mm -hmm. you get the pressure from Rex and from Echo that says we are soldiers. We have a responsibility, you know, for our brothers, right? Yeah. So there, there's a whole nother component to it. So you can just imagine the the conflict that Hunter feels, right? Yep. We got the student driver, student flyer scene, which was oh, probably a highlight. I love this yeah. so much. Yep. The tech turn. Oh gosh, that was so perfect. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, it's funny that we, we call it, and they've done it, in, you know, it's funny, they've done it in the series a few times mm -hmm. and didn't ever really, I mean, it was always a cool maneuver, but then there was just something about the way that was edited and the sound that they, like the sound effects and stuff. It was like perfect the way they edited that, that, that whole scene together when she spins that thing around. Uh, just um, everything about that sequence of her in the driver's seat, just the yeah. biggest smile on her face. And then yep. of course, when, when Echo is detected on the thing and she gets so excited, her voice cracks, you know. Yeah. Havoc five, havoc four. She's so proud right. of herself. Yeah, she's flying the ship. Yeah. And it's funny too, because like you never really hear anything from like tech or any of the bad batch, really. Like anytime they're in distress. I mean, they've been under some pretty intense situations, but there's twice in this scene where where tech is like, oh, like, you know, 
lurching forward and, you know, feeling uncomfortable given that Omega's trying to fly this thing. But it was a really great, great little sequence for her, her character, and just that relationship that continues to build with, with Tat being the mentor and, and teacher there. So, you know, in one of your late night, not sure what to do with my time type of things, you should take the, the back of the Havoc Marauder and put like a bumper sticker on it. So a stupid student driver on the back of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's essentially what it was. They were out in the parking lot, just, you know, doing circles and trying to do parallel parking, essentially. Yeah. Trying, to, trying to learn stick. Yep. Uh, but yeah, Havoc 4 returns, which is Echo. And I loved, yeah, I did love the way Omega like just runs up and like jumps into his arms. Like, ta- you know, Echo's not even expecting that. But, you know, he's, he reciprocates. He has a big, has a big smile on his face yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was really he hits her in the head with the, the screwdriver on his hand, but, you know, that's fine. Well, you, you, you do the best with the tools that you've attached to yourself. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Hello. Nice, nice uh, joke there. Okay. They're trying to figure out, like, okay, so where are these prisoners going? Where are they being transported? Again, we as the audience, I think we know. Again, assuming that's right. Tantus, but, I mean, it could be somewhere else. Yeah, they connected the ship and he's like, hey, I got, I need some data decryption because tech walked up and then they yeah. walk off to the ship and then we flash back over to Tantus with, uh, with Tarkin and Hemlock. Yeah. Which was Steven Stanton, if I'm not mistaken. It was. Welcome back, Steve Stanton. Yeah. Yeah. So or Tarkin's voice, right? Yeah. He's been, a, he's been the staple Tarkin here for a while. He does a great um, Tarkin too. Oh yeah. He's, he's really good. But yeah, I mean, he's essentially the, that conversation boils down to, look, we can't let anybody know about Tantus. We need to keep this thing locked down. Sounds like we have leaks internally. They're definitely aware of it. This gets confirmed a little bit later with, or just, it just been confirmed, I think with Echo at that point. Um, and that, you know, rogue clones are, are, are kind of the, the reason for leaks as if the empire needed another reason, you know, to put these down indiscriminately whenever something bad happens. Now it's like you're everybody, it feels like they're all going to be just enemies of the empire at this point because they can't be trusted. Right. Yeah. And again, you talked about, you know, signals, I mean, Hemlock saying, look, I told you that decommissioning clones peacefully and the way you're doing it is not effective. Like right. they will, they will revolt in some way. They're too dangerous to be left in their current thing. If you ship them all here, I can handle them. I've got a system. I've got something that works that I'm working on. And it's interesting because this is where Tarkin's like, okay, well, I expect a full debrief at the summit. Now the summit was in lowercase letters in the subtitles, but we know the next episode is called, you know, the summit. summit. I'm I, I'm thinking it is, but keep going. Right. So it, it's a it's a summit or a meeting of some sorts, right? Yeah. A, a big pow wow, and so he's going to give him the full plan. And I and I again, all signs kind of point to if this isn't Dark Trooper Phase Zero. I actually, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm probably going to be a little disappointed. You know, if if that if it doesn't all kind of lead that direction, because I just love the tie-in so much with what we're doing with, with Mandalorian, what we saw in the believer, you know, and then, and, and just the, the ideas of what they would do with clone troopers and you know, moving forward instead of decommissioning, it just makes way too much sense. And it would be, it would be perfect for them to be unwilling subjects, you know, for this, this clandestine operation, this off the books, this, you know, really abhorrent program yeah. that it's, it's, it's a you know, torture effectively of what they're doing but again it would make so much sense for them to use the clone troopers rather than looking for any other kind of volunteers in that regard and they've got opportunities here to do it again a little bit different from legends and how all that went but i think no less effective yeah yeah uh i'm with you too like i feel like there is going to be some summit of some sort uh officially um you know maybe it's like an earnings call i don't know Uh, maybe it's a big corporate powwow you know talk about the future some teasers here about how many subscriber numbers they've got. <laughs> something like that. Bob Iger will lead the call. You know, I don't know. It, it feels like they are going to do something similar. And I think, you know, doing that, talking about that program would probably make sense at this point. There's, um, there's a couple different things, a couple, we don't really know. I mean, it really depends on where they want to take the, this era of star Wars uh, and, and maybe even the future of it later on down the road. But that feels like that's really what's going to happen here. The, we also get from Tarkin too. Like he does, he does sound very interested in what, what uh, Hemlock is putting together. Right. So it does sound like it's going to be a presentation of sorts. And, right. um, you know, maybe they've, they've got other clones that have now become believers and they're going to show them off and what they can do and, and all that. So it'd be interesting. Cause I think that will ultimately shape the direction of season something like a season three, right. The new evil is going to be fighting their own kind that are believers and, you know, 
how far do they go? Is it, you know, kill on, kill on site or is it a rescue mission for all of these people and stun them all and, and see if we can fix them in some way, rehabilitate them in some way. That's going to be a very tricky situation for anybody that's still around uh, at that point. Yeah. And again, again, I think that's why it really strongly suggests that season three is at least in the plan. And it's the expectation is that we would be able to do it because it's like, we know the program goes on. Let's just assume it's dark trooper because it is. So it, if, if the plan goes on, we know it goes on. Yeah. So it just makes too much sense for this to be the genesis of it and to be the reasoning behind it. And I'm with risk made a comment in the, in the chat here. He says, uh, you think they're going to convert the clone commandos too? It's kind of weird to me. They are still there. I agree with you. And I thought about this too, was they still rely on these clone commandos like Scorch and whoever else they've got around. Mm -hmm. They still have them. Hemlock is employing them too. Yeah. So why are they still there? Like what is, what is unique about them? Are they already part of that program in some way? Are they prototypes? I mean, is there something different about it? We know there's a lot of commandos that we've seen. I don't know if you call it a battalion. Again, I don't know what the size of these things are very well. My apologies for those who are more vested in some of that stuff. But you know, we know there's more than just onesies, twosies. But what what's so special about them? Why do they seem to be have be given this preferential treatment when we have the regs, you know, the other regs, and you know, just the regular outfits seem like they're not? So, what is different or unique about them? Well, I think it's a stopgap for now. Like, I think their time is limited. It's only a matter of time before they come, but they probably bring a very specific skill set, experience, you know, um, and, and so they are keeping them around until they can get these inscripted soldiers up to speed and, and to the point where they feel like they can do an, as good of a job as those commandos. And once that happens, to me, if it were me, if I was the Empire, a liability is a liability right? The risk is always going to be inherent and that these guys matter who they are, what they do until they've been turned into a believer, you're always going to run that risk. So why, you know, keep them around any longer than you have to. So it's probably, in my opinion, it's just a stopgap. And at some point that's going to run out. Time's going to run out for them and Scorch and everybody else is going to become, you know, the same. They're going to, their, their fate will be the same as the others. And for Hemlock, again, the, the, the question I keep asking myself is why would Hemlock keep them around? If he feels this way, it's about the clones. He feels like it's a loose end that needs to be tied. Is it really a stopgap or is he already, is it, are they really like a prototype? Well, I mean, they could are be. They, yeah, no, I'm with you. I get what you're saying. Yeah. They, maybe yeah. he has done something to them or some initial phase or that, that would make sense that he would be that I, I comfortable. Think, I think it would make sense. I, I don't know if it's the case or not, but it seems sure. like it would at least make sense of how that inconsistency would be addressed. Okay, well, let's get to, I guess, the, we'll kind of wrap it up here in a little bit here, but the we get back to Pabu and the whole conversation that's happening behind, between Hunter and Echo, and I, was, I misspoke. This is when he tells them, hey, there are other people out there. We've got people on the inside, people laying low, right. a lot of folks everywhere that are kind of bucking up here against this whole system. Building this um, network, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a network. It's a very small network. He does say that uh, right now. Um, and he does kind of say, you know, they've got, I mean, they've got project scope at least planned. It's not, they're not trying to take down the empire, right? There's no one going to do that. Um, and I think that's, who was it that said this, something very similar? Like, you're not going to stop the empire. Yeah, Hunter calls him out and says, you know, what are you, what are you doing? You can't fight the empire. You've seen what you're up against. There's no beating them. Yeah, yeah. And to his credit, Echo, like you said, his, his, his focus is laser sharp. It's not about that. And he has conviction, right? It's mm -hmm. not about winning. It's about saving our brothers. Yeah. And that's something, it was really poignant because it's something that Echo understands that I don't know if the if, of the traditional Clone Force 99, the original crew, really get, even still. Like, they don't have that that connection with the regs like Echo did, right? right? Or even like an Omega might. You know, with the, Omega has seen so many over her, even just short, you know, period of time of, or a short life. I guess she's probably been around almost as long as the rest of them have. But I mean, so she's seen a lot of them too. So that's who she associates with. And so she could at least have that compassion for them where Hunter, Echo, and company don't necessarily, Hunter and uh, Tech and Wrecker and Crosshair have always been unique and pulled apart and separate from them and really kind of you know, castaways a, a bit from that. They're all, they've always been separate. They've always been segregated. Yeah. You know, both because they've had that superiority, but also because they're not the same as everybody else. So they've kind of were cast out as well, right? So mm -hmm. it's a it's an interesting dichotomy of, Echo gets that, but how much does Hunter really care or believe that? I think I think Hunter's conflicted. He understands it surface level, but he doesn't have that connection like Echo does because he didn't go and serve with any of these guys. Maybe a Rex, maybe a Cody, but 
really not many beyond that. Yeah. Well, and I think that's part of, I think that's part of the growth that we're growth that we're seeing with them. They're probably more in line with these really are our brothers than they ever have been, especially coming off of, you know, the clone wars. And like you said, the separation and, uh, the, the, how they were treated. Right. I mean, they were almost, I mean, there were people trying to start fights with them, you know, remember that in, in the clone wars. Right. So they weren't liked by them. So it's, it probably for them, it never even crossed their mind that these guys were of the same literal DNA. Uh, but I think they've come around to that too. And you've got people like Echo and like you said, Omega who are pushing for that. Right. And, and, and making them open, letting them open their eyes or helping them to open their eyes to who these folks really are and what they mean. The empire is helping as well, because according right. to the empire, they're all the same, right? They, they don't see anything. There's no differences between them. They're all clones, regardless if they're the bad batch and enhanced or they're just regular regs, uh, to them, it's all the same person and they're just something that needs to be squashed out and taken out, decommed, whatever it is. So all that's going to play into that. And I think at some point they will kind of come around to this idea that we really are part of the regs, which would be kind of cool. Like it would be nice to see, you know, regs embracing them and cheering them on because we've never, never really seen that, you know? Um, so, all right. So all that makes sense. I think what Hunter, and Hunter does ask a good question, like what, when will it be enough? Right. Like, how far does this go? Like, we know as we there's thousands of clones that are out there, tens of thousands of clones out there in the galaxy right now. And are they really trying to plan or trying to solve or, for everything? Are they trying to save all of the clones? Where are they going to house these folks? Uh, you know, especially with the Empire that's trying to, you know, take them out. So it's a good question. I don't know that, you know, we have any good answers as to where this is going to go. I think in Echo's mind, it's like we save everybody and try to figure that out later. Rex is probably in that same boat probably throw Cody in there, you know, but it's a big galaxy. I mean, there's multiple places that they can store a lot of these folks and house them uh, long-term. Right. But yeah, then they decrypt the data, right? So tech has an update for them. They get the data decrypted and they hear plan 88, the seeker. What do you think that means to them though? I mean, it does it plan 88. Like I, I would imagine it's like someone's looking for you. Like that's code. You know, it's like a, yeah. You know, if you're on a walkie talkie, what is it like 10, four, 10, 20, what's your 20 that, I mean, it's, it feels like this is how they're using these codes. Uh, plan 88. What do we got? Plan 99 is the last episode. Is that right? Right. Yeah. So it feels like these are pre-programmed, predefined, planned plans and whatever that one is, it sounds like they have orders. I mean, that's how I interpret it. There's going to be or, like, there has to be some orders behind it. Otherwise he would say they're coming for you and just leave it at that. But plan 88 implies that there is there are some actions that he's telling them they need to take a, a, in some some way yeah and it, it seems to suggest that it was more of go into hiding so the seeker at least how i believe it was a uh, tech that said it is like basically we're being hunted you know we are mm -hmm. we're the target so i think that's the that's the warning but then the implied tactics behind all of that is go into hiding lay low you know take additional precautions find cover, you know, all of those things. I imagine that's the actual, you know, tactical discussion or the, the actual implementation you need to do. You start taking actions in that way is what it seems like. But again, Hunter's a little uncertain about this, right? He kind of feels like maybe it's a trap. Well, they've been deceived by him before, yeah. I mean, he has, but it's, it's an interesting trap though, right? So if you think about it, Crosshair has been captured, you know, possibly turned on the Empire. Again, looking at this from Hunter's perspective, seemingly turned on the empire, but is this all a route? And then he's given them a warning to stay away, mm -hmm. but he's, he's shown his location. Right. But, it, and, and so, and again, it's a little too convenient, right? You find him on these logs and then you get this message. Now, if Hunter were to think about that, some of these things were not, and maybe they were contingency, right? Maybe the empire said, oh crap, we think this may have been leaked. What can we do? Oh, maybe if it's going to eventually get to the Bad Batch or Clone Force down your mind, then we can send this message out. But again, Tech had to go look for it too, right? It yeah. wasn't like it just came to him. He had to go search the old signals that they had stopped using, the old, the old frequencies. They didn't use them anymore. Yeah. Because they had changed because they knew they were all compromised. So it, it's it's kind of an interesting one of Hunter. Again, I think to your point, he's just kind of reacting in that moment saying, he burned us before. And I'm still a little bit bitter about that one. you know. But again, the the other... The other, uh, the facts are all lining up in a way that says, well, you know, something's Maybe happening something, with Crosshair. some truth here, yeah. Right. And at this point, Crosshair's not shown nearly any inclinations to do us any favors. 
So, you know, what are we going to do with this? Right. And we don't really get that answer. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious as to what is the, again, assuming they're going to go there, which I would expect them to, what was it that, like, what was the la- what was the deciding factor for them to say, you know what, we can't, like, they're going to, to me, it feels like they're going to have this conversation about, okay, could it be a trap? Yes, it is Hunter. He's one of our own. How is he any different than any of the other clones that are out there, right? I mean, they've got to rationalize this in some way. And maybe it just boils down to, oh, well, no, they didn't get this. They, you said they the signal got cut off, but they don't know anything about Omega, right? You said that? They, so the reason why I say that is because in, well, there's two things. So one, when, when, uh, Crosshair is, sen- is sending the message. He says, plane 88, and they, you see the tower, and it goes, and then they, they say, there's an unauthorized signal. They shut it off. You see it shut off, and then it cuts back to Crosshair, and that's when he says, you have to hide her or whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. Take cover or whatever it is. When we go over and they're deciphering the message, Tech never mentioned any of that stuff. All he mentioned was plane 88, and then he interpreted that the seeker, you know, we're being hunted, we're being warned. You know th- that type of thing. So there was no other context. So that's that's why I'm making that that connection of saying that the rest okay. of that message got cut off because we saw it go down before he said it, and then they didn't talk about it at all. But I think yeah. this kind of goes back to like this is like Luke and Leia's conversation in Return of the Jedi on at the Ewok village, right? You know he he's conflicted, but he has to try. He can't not do it because there is a chance that there is still good in Vader, right? Mm-hmm. So there's still a chance that that crosshair is crosshair worth saving is he worth risking ourselves for at this point knowing that there is something bigger going on and it fits echo's narrative and if echo's like well i'm gonna go there because this seems like all signs point to wherever this is you know we need to find out we need to find out more about it we got to go do it and now they have a vested interest to go with him yeah so it seems like to me like they don't really have a choice but they might debate it a little bit they might feel they're conflicted about it but i think at the end of the day you have to take the chance that you know what he he is still one of us. Well, and I think that's right. And I think if anybody is going is not going to be debating this, it's Omega. Like I don't even think she's going to hesitate. I think she's going to say we got to go after him. He's our brother. You know, she had that whole conversation with him at the very end. Uh, you know, call it childhood innocence and and pure heartness heartness. But uh, I I feel like she's going to be the one that's like, no, this is even if even if they all were against it. She may be the deciding factor. She may not say even the deciding vote. Like, I don't, maybe she's a tiebreaker. I don't know, but it feels like they're going to do what she wants them to do um, and, yeah. and kind of be the voice of reason, the good conscience there and say, look, we got to go rescue him. It's, this is why are we even talking about this, right? It's non debatable as far as she's concerned. So, either way, I mean, I think that, that it, it aligns with her character. Um, uh, but Again, they're going there. I, there. There's no no doubt in my mind at this point that that's what's going to happen. Dale had an interesting comment here, and, and I was going to bring this up as well. If you wanted to be very cynical about Emery, and completely, it's actually that one right there. Yeah, so I think Emery was staged. They took a chance to let him get that message out, and she got lucky. If you want to take a more cynical view of it, Emery is so invested in what Hemlock is doing is that she gave, she gave Crosshair the opportunity to semi-escape she said all the right things in order to make sure she didn't get killed, all with the expectation of and taking the chance that he would get the message out so that they would bring Omega to them in service of the Empire rather than being sweet on Crosshair. Mm. Maybe. So if, if you want to be a more, like, uh, draw a harder line with Emery, you know, and say that, no, no, she really does not care about him in any capacity, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's definitely a risk they could have taken. And, and, and Dale kind of pointed it out there about, you know, when they let the Falcon go, you now we've got it tagged. So we'll, we'll go and hunt it down. Yeah, right? right. So I think that, yeah, and it makes sense. I, I wouldn't be against that at all. Like, I think that would be actually good for her and her character. I think it'd be awful. I want her to, I want her to love Crosshair. Oh, I know. You've already shipped them. That's right. Yes. So. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you for taking my feelings into account. <laughs> so the, it ends with torture again, essentially, you know, Hemlock coming in and says they're going to up the injections. And to give him, you know, keep doing it until he gives them the information and they want to break him at this point. So, you know, how this how this bodes into him being a believer. I don't know. I mean, maybe he's not on the table or not in the plan. I think it's like, cool, let's get the information out of him. If he lives and we get the information, then sure, go ahead and make him a believer. But I think he's just fine, given how many clones they have, that they can turn in. They don't necessarily need him. 
Although there are some benefits to having somebody like him because of his uh, abilities. And yeah, he's a he's special, right? So I mean, yeah. why would him like not want to experiment with crosshair above a rag, right? So I it, we'll see. Um, I really we'll see wanted to goes. read. I really wanted. Sorry to interrupt you. I really wanted to read more into Emery's expression. But when I listened to the uh, what is audio the, descriptors? Uh, yeah, the audio description. It said that her face was set. I believe so. It mm. was very. Yeah, it didn't help me out in that case. Although it looks like she has a, a look of concern, I'm probably reading a little bit too much into that because now I'm invested in this relationship. See? Now you know how I feel. Yeah, this is a pretty awful feeling, man. I don't know how you look <laughs> like this. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess the that's where it goes. Uh, that's how, how it ends. And I think for Crosshair, yeah, I mean, I think there's hope there for him in terms of like, Again, coming around, getting saved. Where does he go? I don't know. We'll we'll see. I think we kind of talked about a couple of different uh, ways that could go. Right. Um, what do you what do you see this going for? Like season three? Like I, I know it's probably premature, and we'll have a better, clearer understanding, or maybe not, in just a few hours here. But uh, do you feel like uh, one season three feels like it could be a thing, or and or how? do you feel the direction the show is going to go? Like, where is it going at this point? Is it going to be focused on Rex and Echo rescuing of them? Where's the cloning stuff? Are we going to get back to Palpatine potentially and midichlorians? And I like what you did with the Andor, by the way. I saw that. Um, I, I think this goes into, again, I'm, I'm all in on the whole dark trooper aspect of it. I like that Tanta, like I, I like Tanta's having something like still somehow surviving all of this, even though, Presumably, Clone Force 99 is going to show up. Presumably, Echo and Rex would be there as well. I think we're kind of ruling out the whole Air of the Empire stuff, though. We've not, not hey, had you talk about no, that. No, not. We, oh, okay. There's still a path. All right. There's, there's, there's still a path. Uh, In the Padilla fan it's, fiction. That's it's been overgrown with weeds, but right. I will uh, figure stay out tuned to, to get there. Stay tuned to Jedditorials for how we're going to get <laughs> exactly. there. Exactly. So I, I like the, I, I want that to stay because I like this really secret operation. I like all of that you know, still existing throughout the, this transitional era of the empire and this growth aspect of the empire and really cementing these really secret operations that they've got going on about what they want to do. So I hope that continues. And I, I really hope that season three leans a bit more into that, right? So you can expand this into, is it just Bad Batch? No, probably not. It might be more inclusive of Echo and Rex and a Cody or whatever else. And kind of, I like the idea though, of moving in kind of what you had. It feels a little a team ish, you know, if you, if you want to view it that way, but at the same time, I think there's interesting, compelling stories there besides a, a, if we're going to do mission of the week, having it kind of mean something and be able to further that story in different ways, because it's like clone wars, but it's the, it's almost like the opposite side of the clone wars. It's like clone wars turned on its head. Yeah. Yeah. Right, which I think it, and Bad Batch is a bit of that anyway, but we could be officially kind of turning it all on its head and the show evolves into something like that. And they're still the central characters, but they're within this larger operation, even if we just focus on this particular strike team and what they're doing. And I find that I find that interesting. Like, I don't mind mission of the week type of thing if it's serving a larger story yeah. and we're getting those elements going through and we're, we're kind of doing it in a in a creative way. It's not as prescriptive in that way, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the, I think that's the important part. It doesn't feel like we're just being fed the same thing over and over and over, but I like where this is headed. I think it, I think it does steer clearly that the expectation and the wish is to have season three and, and, or beyond, or maybe beyond that. Yeah. yeah. So I, I like that we're at least positioning that way. I really hope it's not a casualty of just the, the restructuring and the reprioritization of Disney as a whole, as an entire company, as a development firm. And then that, that perspective. But again, just because something is put on hold doesn't mean we won't come back around to it either. You know, so, but I, I hope this has been a pretty, pretty consistent type of thing. They can take time to develop it. We have a lot of other content, so it doesn't necessarily have to be out in a year. It could be a year and a half again. You know, this one was pushed back considerably. So you have a lot of flexibility in, in when you would deliver something like this, you know, depending on what makes sense, you know, company wise, if you want to go that route. Yeah, on that, just just kind of uh, my thoughts on that. And there, we didn't really talk about it. There's been a lot of discussion here lately about the direction. Bob Iger has already signaled they've got layoffs coming. You know, they canceled or they they put uh, Willow season two on ice. Uh, they they've been very clear. It's not been canceled. It's just been put on ice, and right. that can mean a couple different things to different people, right? Uh, either way, but 
I think the one thing that I would say about Star Wars, and I don't, I'm not too crazy and excited and, and scared about, you know, skies falling in terms of Star Wars because they don't really have a big target on their back. You know, uh, Marvel, some of their own internal Disney stuff. I mean, they have so many shows and I don't know what those numbers are, but the fact that you've only got, you know, at any given time, one thing coming out from Star Wars, they seem like they'd be pretty far down the, on the list of things, even with the number of shows they still got coming out. They're not cranking out four or five shows on top of each other like we're seeing with some of these other this other stuff. So I don't think if they've got a big target. I, well, I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to money and what the production values or the costs are. are not, that's you know, it's going to be a financial decision at right. the end of the day. And so maybe you know they're not probably uh, uh, you know free from that kind of uh, scrutiny. But you know, I eventually they'll probably come back to all this stuff either way. Like you said, um, I'm going to hold them to that too. So, uh, and you know, on top of all that, let me just say on top of all that, you've got Dave Filoni, John Favreau. They've been good for the the franchise. They've been good to the series. They've been good for Disney plus. And I think that holds merit. So, you know, if these are projects that these guys are definitely passionate about and want to continue, I think they're going to get first, you know, right of refusal. Uh, and maybe it's some of the other stuff that, you know, we don't know has been planned and talked about. Maybe they're scrapping that stuff or putting that stuff on ice and, we're going to get to see all those other, all those, we'll know here in just a few weeks, I think, ultimately at, at Celebration too. Yeah, I agree. And that that's kind of the premise of some of the questions is as we get ready for Celebration, you know, the show wraps up, could an announcement come about season three of The Bad Batch? I mean, it's difficult to put a lot of stock in any kind of announcements these days right now anyway, because it all seems like it's in flux. Whether it's official or not, we can, we can debate that, but it, it just seems like everything is... I mean, you hear one thing, you feel like, okay, that that's definitely going to take root. That's definitely going to start, you know, growing mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. and sinking its roots in, and and then it's ripped out from underneath you. It, it yeah. feels like that, at least, right? Even if that's not reality. What I would hope is that Bad Batch is one of these known commodities. It's consistent. Hopefully, the numbers are there. That's my one concern about the show is whether the numbers are there to support the cost and the effort to put into a sixteen season production, sixteen episode production for a season. Right? Does it get scaled back? We saw this with Clone Wars. I mean, more than once, unfortunately. And we had a season cut cut way short. We had it canceled multiple times. It had been moved networks. I mean, all sorts of things because of the same type of trend that might be happening with Bad Batch as well. But it's not a quality problem necessarily as it is. Maybe it's a marketing type of thing. Maybe it's just because it's an animation, whatever it might be. You know, it's, there's there's something about it that might not always have that that big massive viewership behind it like a Mandalorian will. So it'll be interesting how they interpret that. It'll be it'll be telling what we hear at Celebration. It will be telling as we get into September with the uh, D23. Any, yeah. I mean, this is where the things like the investor calls can have little nuggets of giving us some amount of nugget as to what to expect from yeah, some of these. Which way other, the wind's blowing on some of this stuff. That's a great way to put it, yeah. And not anything, nothing decisive, of course, because things do get moved on and off the slate, they get moved timelines and things change, of course, but it would be really great. I, I think this is a really consistent show. I think it's consistently high quality. I think it really found a good entertainment stride this year, like really, really well with this season. I really enjoyed it. I think I enjoyed it much more than last season overall, even and we could argue, you know, how, how important it was this season, but I think just the moments that we had were really, really good. Maybe one episode, is an exception to all of that, but the rest of it I really thought was great. Yeah, and so I really hope that gets I hope that gets rewarded. I hope that gets continued, and we're able to do this. And I, my guess is, if we get another Bad Batch season, it's probably eighteen months away. I think it's probably a good ways away. I don't think it's any time yeah. really soon. This one was about I want to say this one was about eighteen months or so removed as well. Again, with a, it was with a while a, with a considerable delay. We thought it was going to come out in the fall, right? Yeah, of twenty twenty two. Well, that's what they had said originally. And then right, yeah, and that then day came, came and went. <laughs> we were like, it didn't happen the next week, guys. <laughs> yeah, so it didn't start what until January, right? So. Yeah. So but again, so we'll, we'll see what comes of it. But you know, I think uh, it, let's end the season on the high note. Let's get a lot of excitement in here. Let's get the fandom energized, and let's you know, let's really support this show because I think it's something that you know, I think there's a great story that's developing here, and I don't think we're done with it yet. We got to sneak this in quickly. Um, um, Beacon Holidays, Be Beacom Hel Holiday says, hello, nothing really to comment. Just on my lunch break saying hi. Glad for more Crosshair. He wasn't my favorite at the beginning of Bad Batch, but definitely the most compelling as time goes on. Uh, I don't think you're going to find anybody that disagrees with that. He has certainly been a standout character. And you've got to be somewhere in Europe because if you're on lunch now, it's 1030 here. So, yeah. 
thanks for, for chiming. I think he's, I think that person's been here before. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for chiming in. Hope work's not going too bad for you. Uh, it's probably, probably like Australia, but yes. Yeah, probably. But no, actually, well, well said. Yeah. Crosshair was a character we didn't really, yeah, there you go, Australia. I got yeah. it right. Hey, my memory is not terrible. <laughs> not right now. But yeah, no, great way of putting it. Crosshair was a character that was kind of, eh, I like him, but we don't really know enough about him. We just kind of yeah. hate him. Yeah. You know, but now it's, he's the, man, you, you can't get enough of him. I think him and Omega are my favorites. I feel everybody else I like, I, like I've liked tech. Wrecker still is kind of, the one that I keep coming back to is being kind of like, the man eh, is Hunter now. And he was like the one that I was really, I was like, oh man, this guy's got so much potential. He's the leader. And I'm not saying he's a bad character, but. He had his moment in season one, right? I mean, and yeah. you're right. He's kind of settled into giving people freedom. He's the dad that's not sitting back, kicking his feet up, but he's definitely given people, he's being a good leader, I think, in a lot of ways, right? Sure, yeah. And yeah. he's being a caretaker, but he's giving people the flexibility. He's supporting them in the right way, but it's not interesting. Right. I mean, that's the thing. Like sometimes good leadership's not the most interesting thing because you've got a well-oiled machine kind of running around you. Uh, I mean, they're still not accomplishing missions very well, but I mean, still it's, <laughs> I mean, he, he's kind of doing the right thing. And, but again, I think we might see that come around a little bit though. Right. And we get a little bit of that with his conversations with Echo, a little bit with Shep. With Shep, yeah. So there's still something there, but is it, is it as compelling as Crosshair? No. Is it as compelling as maybe what Rex and Echo were doing? Probably not. No. Yeah. But again, we'll everyone see. has their moments. I think that's great. But again, where's the broader narrative going to take us? I hope these next two episodes really give us a great, great delivery on the end of the season and then show us what's possible going forward. Okay, well, let's end the episode there because uh, I need to get some rest in before we I do this whole marathon tonight with Mandal Mandalorian and these two seasons of uh, or two episodes of The Bad Batch. That's great. Yeah, so let's do a few shout outs here on the live stream again. If you are listening to the show, thank you for downloading the episode, first of all. But if you'd like to come out and visit us Sundays and Thursdays, 9 p.m. Central in the U.S., you could be like one of these amazing people. CantinaCast.com slash YouTube. Steph, Lauren, Jonathan, Scott, Qui-Gon, Jay, Alex, Hart Counter, Tom, Jorge, Dale Risk, on Beacom Halliday. If I missed anyone, my sincere so apologies. But thank you all for coming out onto the show again. CantinaCast.com slash YouTube. You can hit the subscribe button. You can be notified whenever we go on air. You think you get a notification about every half hour before we come on air. So you never miss an episode and you can come out and pay us a visit. Again, brand new episodes out there for Jedi Novel Archive. Also on the YouTube channel from Lauren. Go check that out. She's doing an amazing job. Thank you for supporting her and welcoming her to the team doing fantastic we're super excited about that and continue to support that so she's got both uh, uh the blade comic series as well as the the beginning of wave three of phase two there we go i said it right for the high republic with cataclysm by lydia kang so spoiler free sneak peek on that one all right lots of great content still coming up we've got uh we'll break down Mandal mandalorian here on tuesday i don't know we'll see i guess let's let's make a decision on whether or not we're going to break because i have a feeling it may be more substantial. To, I don't know. We'll, we'll figure this out. But I was thinking, you know, if, if we get, I love this is pull an audible live. Oh, well, I, don't <laughs> I don't want to get ahead of myself. Cause it could be that the bad batch season two ends like on a really high note and something crazy happens. And I'm thinking, do I really want to wait till Sunday to talk about that? So here's a guarantee. Okay. We will have a show on Thursday. <laughs> right. What that show may be. And it's going to be flipping amazing. Yeah. Right. Because it's always amazing with this guy yeah. right here. Yeah. Well, thank so, you. you too. Yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll prioritize what we think is most interesting to everyone. How about that? Yeah. Good tip. Everyone wear your bandanas next week uh, or the next show here. Uh, and Jonesy's reaching back for his right now. I oh, know he's putting the tinfoil hat on. So, okay. Well, that's uh, where we're, we're going to end the show on a high note, just like that. And we'll be back in just a few days to, to break down something. So join us then, please. You're still listening? Wow, that's amazing. Well, I'm here to give you the disclaimer. Normally we do a big, long, drawn-out disclaimer thing saying what's what and who's what and all that other stuff, but I think you guys kind of know that Lucasfilm and Disney have uh, no affiliation with us at all, uh, and we have none with them. Uh, we talk about Star Wars, which is their property and all that other good, fun stuff, uh, but I think you can tell which is our stuff and which is their stuff. If you can't, well, then send a lawyer to send an email to me, and I'll be glad to chat with them. Other than that, you know what's what, so that's your disclaimer. 